So we're moving through the chapter on gas power cycles or gas power systems. We basically did a quick summary or overview of the internal combustion engine, and then we approximated for the gasoline engine, the auto cycle, and then for the diesel type engine or the fuel that feeds the diesel type engines, the diesel cycle. Uh, now we move into what we call the Brayton cycle. What's that? It's another cycle. It's a gas power cycle. And it um, is an approximation of what happens in gas turbines. Gas turbines were developed much later than the, um, than the auto engine, gasoline or diesel engines, the auto cycle that approximated the diesel cycle. And uh, they basically came in uh, basically hydraulic turbines, then steam turbines, and gas turbines came into being in the last 50 to 100 years. Uh, here is a uh, image of one used as a power plant, and so a power plant to make uh, electricity. It's pretty complex, but right here is a shaft coming out that you would bolt up to another generator, and that's the way you might generate electricity. Um, the air would be coming in, and they did a cutaway here. Often you pull the air in and pull it down, and then it enters around that shaft, and it goes through a bunch of compressor stages, and I'll show a video to help see that. And then it, it's high pressure, and then you have in a circle a bunch of canisters which inject the fuel, and so you have combustion. And so now it's not only high pressure, but it's also high temperature after the combustion. And you go typically through fewer uh, turbine stages to extract mechanical energy out of that fluid stream. So it's made up of a compressor, a combustion chamber, and turbine, plus some intake and uh, exhaust components. But those are the, that's the heart of it. Let's just take a look. This is a BBC. Uh, how does a gas turbine work? It's a little over a minute, and uh, bang goes the theory. So let's take a quick look at this one. Here's a simple little version of built here. What's here. at the front of a gas turbine on an industrial scale? Uh, I mentioned about going and getting uh, education off your neighbor's trash pile or your friend's trash pile of a broken lawnmower. I don't know of a way to get hands-on experience with a gas turbine. They're way too expensive. So you're stuck if you want to see something, go to YouTube. Um, or take a tour uh, where somebody could show you, but uh, you can't really turn it on. Here's another one that's a little more detailed. Let's go ahead and watch that one. <laughs> 101. So, with that introduction, let's jump into a very simplistic uh, evaluation of the system. So, we go through a compressor, then we go through a combustor where fuel is added, and then after the combustor, really, you have the nitrogen that was with the oxygen and nitrogen that come in in air. As one of the videos said, you can roughly say that one-fifth of air is oxygen and 80% um, four-fifths is nitrogen. That's a good approximation. Um, uh, if you live in Houston, every now and then it feels like the water vapor <laughs> is a, a major component of the air, and it is when you have hot, humid air. Okay, but then after the combustion, you want that methane, CH4, to mix with the oxygen, and you want to produce CO2. You want that carbon to go to carbon dioxide. You want the hydrogen to go to H2O, water vapor. And so it's not that complex, the combustion of a hydrocarbon fuel. CO2 and H2O water vapor are in the, the products. And you then have a lot of, the same amount of nitrogen. Hopefully it didn't have a lot of uh, reactions, although NOx, N-O-X, is a ba major concern in the emissions of uh, combustion engines and gas turbines. Uh, but you have the CO2 and the H2O and then whatever unused oxygen. And if there's any unused fuel that would go out to or uncombusted fuel. Then it passes through the turbine and then out the exhaust. Well, that's the real system. What do we do is we simplify the analysis by closing the loop and then replacing those complex combustion processes with uh, 
just a simple heat exchanger as well as this heat exchanger to get the loop closed. So what do we do? We, we will perform what we call an air standard analysis, just like we did an air standard auto and air standard diesel. We'll have an air standard Brayton cycle analysis. So it's always air. There's no changing. There's no fuel needed in the sense of combustion. You have uh, always behaving as an ideal gas. The combustion is replaced by heat transfer in. Q in this combustor. Maybe I talk like that for the QN. And uh, the intake exhausts are replaced by heat transfer. Here, I'm going to show it as a QN to the heat exchanger, but that's really a heat rejection, and that'll be a negative amount. So we have uh, work transfer coming out of that uh, turbine, WT. And I'm going to show it coming out of the compressor. We'll put WC, and we know that also is negative because it's not the compressor doesn't produce work, it consumes work. And we introduced the states uh, consistent with the textbook. State one is the inlet to the compressor, two, three, four, there you go. So we have four states, four components, four major possible heat and work transfers. And uh, if you have a cold air standard analysis, it's everything, but then the constant specific heats are evaluated at 25 C, which is 298 Kelvin, or I like to round off to 300 Kelvin so students don't have to interpolate. But the difference between the specific heats at 298 and 300 are negligibly small compared to other approximations we've introduced. So with this, what we can do is analyze the cycle. Let's step through it. One thing that is very confusing, I'll try and explain this right away, is when you come off of learning about the auto and diesel cycle, you're used to a parameter called R, the compression ratio. And during the compression stroke, you had a change in the volume from a large volume to a small volume. That was a parameter known as the compression ratio. But that's for a closed system analysis. The auto and the diesel are closed. What we're going to do now is an open system analysis around each of those components. The first might be the compressor. And you might think that they specify a compression ratio for a compressor. That would make sense. But they don't specify a change in volume. They don't specify V2 over V1 because it's an open system. What they specify is they specify P2 over P1. Is P2 over P1 equal to V2 over V1? No. No, it's not. This is, this is not the same. So it's a tongue twister for me. Just bear with me. Every now and then I may misspeak, and I'll, I'll be talking fast, thinking fast. And when I talk about a compressor, when the textbook is talking about a compressor, they're going to specify the pressure ratio. Well, professor, do they use R as a symbol for the pressure ratio? No, thankfully they don't. Guess what they use? They use nothing but P2 over P1. There's no additional, you know, R subscript P. That would make sense to me, like the ratio of pressure, R subscript P. But they don't use it, and I think that's good. Just here's my pressure ratio. It's P2 divided by P1. And that value could be low, like 9 or 8 or 10, or it could be even higher. In some engines, it's very high. Some, it goes up into the 20s, low 20s. All right. So they specify the pressure ratio across the compressor. Let's think about our pressures. Is What about the pressure at 3 compared to the pressure at 2? Would you expect it to be the same? Yeah, that's our standard. With, through a heat exchanger, there's not changing the pressure. But when you drop across the turbine, there's a great pressure change again. You're back down to P4 is equal to P1. So there's the only the, the increase in pressure and then the decrease in pressure. So really, you just have a high pressure side and a low pressure side. All right. And now we want to be able to do a first law analysis for all of these Qs and Ws. Well, the work out of the turbine is the easiest. We're going to assume negligible change in kinetic and potential energy. It's running steady state. And there's no heat transfer around the turbine. It's just a work transfer out. And you'll find that this is H3 minus H4. 
Did that make sense? Yeah, you've done the first law for these components. How about for in with the combustor? That's going to be H3 minus H2. Now, the two that are going to be negative are a little more challenging. How about the heat transfer? We're going to show it going into that heat exchanger. And we're going to calculate a negative Q for that heat exchanger, that heat rejection. That's going to be H1 um, minus H4. Won't H1 be less than H4? Hence, it'll be a negative answer. That's what we want. And then the same for WC right here. It's the specific work out of the compressor. We're going to get a negative quantity, and it's going to be H1 uh, minus H2. So again, I'll just emphasize, this is going to be negative. This is going to be negative. All right. Okay. Now, a lot of times we do the cold air standard analysis. So what, how do we replace the change in enthalpy? We replace it by a C sub P times a change in temperature, true? And that, that C sub P, uh, what does that P on that specific heat stand for? It's the subscript constant pressure. And that makes sense when you look at using it through the heat exchanger. Isn't it system constant pressure through the heat exchanger? That makes sense. But you come down here to the work through the turbine, and isn't that C sub P T3 minus T4? This is one of those places where I'm going to expose you to something where a lot of students will trip. Okay. First of all, is it a change in enthalpy? that gives us the work or a change in internal energy? It's a change in enthalpy. It's an open system analysis. Now, if is enthalpy, the change in enthalpy, is it equal to C sub P times delta T? Mm -hmm. It is. And so it's kind of the same type of questionable like logic. Oh, it's like, hold it. How come? When I'm go going across the turbine, that's not constant pressure. Don't I need a different C sub P? Don't I need a different specific heat? And no, you, it's C sub P. So which pressure is best to use? You need to use C sub P because that's the what for an ideal gas, the change in the enthalpy is a C, the integral C sub P dt, but we pull out the C sub P if it's constant. We're approximating as constant specific heats, and then that's just C sub P delta T. Ah, oh, whatever temperature. Yeah. yeah, if it's cold air, sometimes they'll say a warm air. Okay, what do you mean by warm air? Uh, we think that the max temperature is 1,000 and the inlet temperature is 400, so pick an average in between and then pick, get those values. Uh, and that's pretty accurate, yeah, because it does change as a function of temperature, but it's not like it changes by a factor of 2 or 3 or 20. It changes by a few percent, 15 percent, 20 percent or so, so, or even less. All right, so uh, this is, again, you use C sub P, even though it's not constant pressure through the turbine. Same thing here, it's C sub P, T1 minus T4, when you're using constant specific heats. And then the same here for uh, T, C sub P, uh, T1 minus T2. So the game is very similar to the auto and diesel cycle. You need to get the temperatures. Once you get the temperatures, you get the enthalpies. Get the difference in the enthalpies, you have the works and heat transfer for the major components, then you can analyze the system. These are the three relations that we use with isentropic processes, ideal gas, constant specific heats. All right. These two we've used a lot of already in this chapter when we analyze the auto and the diesel. Why? Because they often have to specify the compression ratio. But when we move to the Brayton cycle, what do we specify? We specify the pressure ratio. So this one, which your old friend, but you haven't used much so far in this chapter, is now we're going to use a lot of. 
when you want to find the temperature two after the compressor, it's the pressure ratio across the compressor raised to the K minus one over K power. See that? So we're going to use that now um, in this problem. So we have an air standard Brayton cycle. It operates with 90 kilopascal and 300 Kelvin at the compressor inlet. And then they give you the compressor pressure ratio. What key word is right there? Pressure ratio. Pressure ratio. All right. The compressor isotropic efficiency is 83%. That's going to be an extra challenge for us. The maximum temperature is 1,600 Kelvin. The turbine isotropic efficiency is 91%. On the basis of a cold air standard analysis, using this value of C sub V and this value of C sub P, determine, and then you just have, oh, get the thermal efficiency and the back work ratio. Well, to get those two, you'd need to basically calculate everything, like all the properties of the cycle and all the Qs and Ws for each of the components. So I would do this. I would make the sketch of the cycle. So you're going to have the compressor. You're going to have the combustor, you're going to have the turbine, and you're going to have some heat exchanger. And so those are the four components. And the flow goes from the heat exchanger into the compressor, state one, from the compressor into the combustor, state two, into from the combustor to turbine, state three, and state four. That's what the textbook uses. That's what most textbooks use. Why not just stay with that numbering scheme and that order and that layout? And then you probably want to help uh, yourself by putting this cycle either on a PV or a TS diagram. Well, we like the PV with the auto and diesel because we talked about the compression ratio. But here, let's just show it on a TS diagram, a temperature entropy diagram. And so state one is low entropy, low temperature, and we put it through a compressor, what do you think? Where is state two in relation to state one on this TS diagram? Straight up. And it's going to be very hot as it comes out of the compressor, and it's going to be a, a lot higher pressure. Well, this is a line of constant pressure, and this is a line of constant pressure on the TS diagram for an ideal gas. And so this is our low pressure, and this is our high pressure. So it was able to jump up to that high pressure. So that's state two. But you know what? We're going to call that state 2S, meaning isentropic compression. But because we have an isentropic uh, efficiency for the compressor, less than 100%, we're going to have state 2 actual, different from 2S. So I would calculate both of those states independently, just like we did for steam turbines and that. Where is state 2 actual in relation to 2S? To the, right. to the right and on the line of high pressure. And so here it is, and that's how you would go. So we would show a solid line going from 1 to 2S and a dashed line from 1 to 2 actual. Notice that the temperature of 2 actual is not the same as 2S, is it? It's higher. It's higher. Now we put the heat through the combustor, and we come out with the highest temperature in the cycle. That's state 3, T3, coming out of the combustor, high pressure. Then we put it through isentropic expansion through the turbine to low pressure. That's 4S. Without shouting it out, where is 4 actual in relation to 4S? A little to the right or a little to the left on the PL line, the low pressure line. A little to the right. Why? Because it's some irreversibilities and you'll have higher entropy coming out. S4 will be greater than S3 because of the irreversibilities. And so there is four actual and then you have heat rejection and that that closes the cycle so hopefully that helps you because you're going to be able to check your numbers and say what is the, how does t4 compare to t4s is it greater less it's greater 
you're less, because of irreversibilities, you're not able to get as much mechanical work out of the shaft of that turbine. Okay. Now, I also want to put a table of properties. So for different states, our properties are going to be pressure. I like kilopascal, temperature in Kelvin. And we'll put state 1, state 2S, 2 actual, state 3, 4S, 4 actual. So I'll have a few, you know, two states for two and then two states for four. All right. Let's put in the information given in the problem. It starts at 90 kilopascal and 300 Kelvin. And they tell us that the maximum temperature in the cycle is 1,600. Where would that go? T3, 1,600. Okay. Now, I like to work through the pressure column. That's pretty easy. So if our pressure ratio is P2 over P1 is equal to 9, that's given right here, 9.0, <coughs> what is the pressure at 2S and 2 actual? 9 times 90? Is that 810? 810. What is the pressure at state 3? 810. First time you work through this, I know I'm going fast, okay? But the first time you have to work through a problem like this, you have to think through why exactly. Every little step, it takes you a lot longer. All right, but then what about 4? Back down to 90. Yeah, so we have all our pressures. Now, how do I get the temperature at 2S, isentropic compression, from state 1? Use the equation we just showed. So it's... T1 times the pressure ratio, P2 over P1, raised to the K minus 1 over K. If you have a calculator, can you please help me by calculating it? So the temperature 1 is 300, the pressure ratio is 9, and the K is 1.4. So it's 0.4 divided by 1.4, the exponent. 0.4 divided by 1.4. We get the three or four people to calculate this for me. Five sixty two, so that's good. Who anybody else get five sixty two? Okay, one more, two more. Anybody else? Three. Perfect. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Um, you hate to lose points on an exam because you mess up some simple calculation like that. Now let's get temperature to actual. Well, we're using the isotropic efficiency of the compressor. Well, what was that? Well, we have to go back and review in Chapter 6. How was that defined? What is the definition? You know, isn't... Right. So the... Why the work of the compressor, if it was isentropic, would be smaller than the work of the compressor that's actually needed to increase it to that pressure, the same pressure ratio. And so this can be replaced by C sub P divided by C sub P times the change in temperatures. And so this change in temperature here would be um, T2S minus T1. And this temperature here is... T2 actual minus T1. Does that look familiar? And then you cancel the C sub P's. I know I skipped the step of the delta H's, but I'm trying to save space. So the temperature 2 actual is equal to the uh, temperature uh, 1 plus 1 over the isentropic efficiency of the compressor times T2S minus T1. I always check myself. I say, well, if, if the isentropic efficiency of the compressor is 100%, isn't T2 actual equal to T2S? And will the equation give me that? And it will. It will. And as the efficiency of the compressor goes down, what happens to the temperature 2 actual? Goes greater, greater than T2S. So if I, I, I compute this number, or let me ask you, a couple people, go ahead and make the computation and show me what you get. 
615.7 is the correct answer. And I want, okay, that's one confirmation. You got it too? That's two, three. Let me get one more. 615.7, you got it? All right. So thank you very much. Okay. Now uh, T3 is given at 1600, but we have to get T4S. Well, you're just not going like a pressure increase. You're going a pressure decrease by the same ratio, aren't you? And so it's the same equations. Let me just say that I, if you were able to analyze the compressor, I'm sure you'll be able to analyze the turbine. And so it drops to 854 if it had been isentropic but it only drops to 921.2 because of the 91% turbine isentropic efficiency. So there we finished that table out. I would encourage you also make an additional table that says for each of the components, you talk about either the Qs in kilojoules per kilogram flowing through it, or the work, the specific work in kilojoules per kilogram flowing through it, what are the components? Let's do compressor. Let's do the combustor. Let's do the turbine. And I didn't leave enough room. Sorry, the heat exchanger. All right. So what about the Q for the compressor? Let's put all the zeros in. How about for the combustor? What's the work? Zero. How about the turbine? Heat transfer? Zero. And the heat exchanger work is zero. So I should have maybe draw it like that. Okay, so now what about the compressor uh, work? Well, you have to use the actual exit temperature, the inlet temperature, the specific heat, and you calculate that it's negative 317.3 kilojoules per kilogram. The heat exchanger, you add 989.2. The turbine, you extract. 682.2 and the heat exchanger you ex extract uh, 624.3. I'm going to scroll just a little bit because if I sum the two numbers in here we get Q net of the cycle it's 364.9 if we sum for the work we get 364.9 they are the same. They need to be the same. Boom. Okay. So at this point, can you calculate the thermal efficiency of the cycle, the answer for part A? Well, it's the work net out of the cycle divided by the heat that was brought into the cycle. The only place it was brought in was in the combustor. And so it's uh, 364.9 divided by 989.2. So we get the thermal efficiency of the Brayton cycle is 36.9%. And the back work ratio? Well, it's what came out of the turbine, WT, had to go back to feed the compressor WC and because WC is negative I'll put an absolute value on that WC and so uh, what came out of the turbine was 682.2 kilojoules per kilogram and 317.3 needed to feed the compressor so the back work ratio comes in at a whopping 46.5 percent and either the auto or the diesel cycle, did we see back work ratios nearly that high? Down by 1%, that's right. And so it was really hard for engineers who were making the steam turbines and the gas turbines and the Brayton cycle where you have a compressor and a turbine working together to make them work because they had to be very efficient. If, if in a gas turbine, if you don't have the compressor very efficient and you don't have the turbine part, the expansion part very efficient, it won't work. But it works beautifully if you can design a good compressor and a good turbine. All right. I forget the annual uh, budget or the how big this business is in gas turbines. It's huge. There's a lot of mechanical engineers working in it, and there's a lot of money in it. 
a lot of profit. That's highly engineered. All right, here are the numbers for that problem. Um, so I just repeat it here. If you're watching the video, you can pause it and take a look. Okay. But uh, I pulled out some other components. I had a longer list of calculate, calculate, calculate. But these are the two. If you can get to there, you, you basically had to calculate everything else. All right. If the turbine isentropic efficiency is 80% of the turbine is 80%, and it changes, and it changes to 75%, so it went down. How does the state four, this here, how does the pressure change? How does the temperature change? How does the enthalpy change? And if you really want to get tricky, the specific volume change, but let's not do that. It, but so uh, who would like to do the pressure? Raise your hand and I'll call on you. All right, pressure. How does the pressure? You're smart. You got your hand up fast. That's the easiest one. It is not going to change. It's going to be unchanged. It's going to stay constant. But you're out. You can't answer anymore. Sorry. So you've already done it. Who wants to handle temperature? Temperature goes up. And it, you have to think about that. And that's why I think that TS diagram helps you think about it. Right? All right. How about you're out, you're out next. Who wants to do enthalpy? Enthalpy. Uh, enthalpy goes, up. goes up because it's proportional to temperature. Yeah, it goes up. Um, anybody? I'd have to think about this. I just asked that question on the fly, the specific volume. But we can figure it out. Who wants to do specific volume? You can't do it. You already participated. <laughs> One of your friends has to do it. Well, let's do this. Is specific volume proportional to temperature over pressure? And we said the pressure did not change because of the reduction in the isentropic efficiency. We still had the same exit pressure, right? <laughs> but the temperature went up. So what happened to the specific volume? It went up as well. Make sense? We're comparing the specific volume of four actual uh, case two compared to the specific volume for actual case one. Case one had the 80% isentropic efficiency. This had the 75% turbine isentropic efficiency. They're not the same. It, it went up, isn't it? Isn't that what we concluded? Very good. Oh, boy. Let's play with the compressor. The compressor isentropic efficiency is 80%. And it now is increased. So it goes up to 85%. Isn't that better? Higher isentropic efficiency for the compressor. How does state 2 change? Well, let's talk about uh, pressure. Temperature, enthalpy. You know, we could also talk about entropy. Forgot entropy on that previous diagram, didn't I? Entropy um, and specific volume. All right, so those that already participated, they're out. Who would like to volunteer for pressure? The, uh, the compressor. Look at our TS diagram. We have a line of... Sorry, doesn't, doesn't change. That's our assumption. Now, I remember when I was taking thermo way back when, I thought, well, if it's less efficient of a compressor, it seems like it would have a harder job getting it up to the same pressure increase. And that's true. But in our assumptions, we basically say that because of the isentropic efficiency, it still achieves the same pressure ratio. It's kind of an implicit assumption. So the pressure is the same. All right, so you're out. Who wants to handle temperature? The temperature. Temperature the, uh, Because of the improvement in performance. You're absolutely correct. So the temperature goes down. Next, who wants to handle enthalpy? All right, enthalpy. It would do what? 
decrease as well. All right, now you got entropy. <laughs> The entropy would go down. You're absolutely right. It would go down. And probably a good way to think of it is, is we were going over to here, but now we're going over to here. See? So this would be um, 2S with uh, efficiency of 80%, and this state is 2, not S, 2 actual. 2 actual, 2 actual with isotropic of 85%. And you, so the S, this is the S, this is a temperature diagram, the, the entropy goes down. You're right. All right, who wants to handle specific volume, the last one? Goes down. And so the same logic, right? This goes down. Those are good games to play, aren't they? All right. Uh, this is what it looks like for that problem plotted. Um, as accurately as I can. What you do, though, when you plot entropy <coughs> is you just sort of have a random starting spot for entropy. So as you could see, I just put S is equal to 1 at state 1. Uh, so always the entropy values, they're a little loose because where's your datum point? Where are you starting the measurements from? Temperature, no, no, we know that it starts at 300 Kelvin. And it goes around, but this is that actual cycle looking uh, through. Okay. Uh, one last, if we had time, I would go ahead and play it. Let me go ahead and play it, and then we'll end today. This one, I don't think they get background noise, but no words. What I like is uh, the showing uh, more closely of the turbine blades. You can kind of see that's the electric generator. People just get up and leave. Uh, but this was, I thought, pretty good for the length of time. You're trying to balance, make it short. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a safe weekend.